So hello everyone on behalf of EuroELSO, it's a very special pleasure for us again to welcome you to our brand new webinar series of uh, EuroELSO. Um, our guest today and our speaker is Justina Swall from Nuremberg, Germany. And uh, as you all of you will remember, last time we talked about something that probably is not conducted so often, namely uh, ECMO in acute liver failure. So we probably have small numbers in very few centers worldwide. And last time we uh, said that there's not a whole lot of data supporting this. Now, surprisingly, the topic that we will discuss today uh, does not have a very solid scientific base basis either on a topic that all of us do, all of us who conduct ECMO, namely weaning strategies for patients on ECMO. Now, Justina will uh, give in her presentation just some general considerations, then the very sparse data on the topic. And uh, it's very exciting that eventually she will present the data of a brand new survey that she conducted on behalf of EuroELSO, so we will learn a lot about local practices in this setting. And before we get started, I would like to remind you, all of you who participate to today's webinar, that uh, in the webinar tool, you can enter your questions. Uh, I will be able to see them and I will sort them out. And uh, in the second part of the webinar, after Justina finished her presentation, when we have uh, this discussion, I will pass the question on to Justina and we can have a discussion about everything that's important to you. So for now, thank all of you for joining and uh, especially thank you very much, Justina, for making yourself available, for putting the effort uh, into this presentation and for offering your time. So now it's up to you. Uh, please give us your perspective on winning strategies on BV ECMO. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, for introducing me. Um, let me just open the presentation. So, um, weaning um, from VV ECMO is a very uh, special um, issue and um, this is also my, um, in my opinion, very hot topic because everybody knows ECMO doesn't kill people. people. This is what we are uh, uh, experience after EOLIA study. So if we um, put the patient on uh, on the ECMO, we also should uh, be able to wean the patient from the ECMO. This is um, the main goal uh, for the lung to recover and uh, to wean the patient um, from um, the ECMO. So um, I have no conflict um, of interest um, to declare. And uh, as we said, the goals of um, respiratory support on VV ECMO is to provide the oxygenation and CO2 removal. It's um, lung protection and lung rest. It's to uh, minimize extracorporeal support to the lowest level needed and to maintain gas exchange. And finally, we want to wean and decannulate the patient. And um, I put all this graphic um, to uh, um, discuss um, what can we bridge on uh, VV ECMO. So we always say it, VV ECMO is a bridge to uh, recovery, bridge to decision, or a bridge to nowhere. And uh, in the best case, if we have lung recovery, we can start the weaning process and then uh, we can decide um, how to wean. We, uh, weaning mechanical ventilation first on ECMO first, or maybe uh, both uh, equal and the same uh, speed. And uh, then we have um, bridge to a decision if there is no lung recovery. And uh, we have uh, mostly first prolonged ECMO. Um, unfortunately, there is no um, device um, which uh, will be comparable to um, assist devices like for the heart. Um, so we do not have an artificial lung which could breach um, um, the lung function for, for the longer time. But um, I believe it can be developed maybe in the next few years. So if there is no lung recovery, there are three possibilities, um, bridge to no destination and futility. 
prolonged ECMO and a wait and watch, and then uh, to decide um, maybe if the patient is lucky and uh, have an organ, and um, this is the bridge to lung, lung transplant, or uh, without destination and uh, futility. So, uh, as uh, patient, uh, as the Peter uh, mentioned, there is a very few um, literature and uh, publications about weaning. And uh, one of them is um, from uh, Broman and um, co-authors about uh, weaning from VV ECMO, uh, VV, um, ECMO how to do it. And um, this, um, this graphic is uh, especially um, to visualize how um, to perform weaning. Weaning starts with the improvement of the natural lung and improving gas exchange, it should be monitored, and um, the weaning process should focus on keeping the balance between natural and membrane lung. So uh, on the membrane lung, we monitor blood flow and a sweep gas flow, and uh, in the natural lung, we monitor CO2 elimination and oxygenation and compliance. Um, weaning process from... Um, the, the VV ECMO starts at the moment of the cannulation and uh, is possible after certain cr criteria are achieved, like recovery from um, recovery of a tidal volume or underlying disease. And this is exactly what um, the authors of the previous publication um, described. There are some differences between um, some centers. Um, so in the Karolinska, uh, they put more attention and more. Um, they focus more on recovery uh, of tidal volume, and Regensburg, for example, uh, is more focused on underlying disease and to start uh, the weaning process first if uh, the underlying disease uh, is stabilized. But um, the optimal weaning strategy still remains unknown, and the main adjustments as we said, is a blood flow, sweep, gas flow, and gas composition. What um, does not mean that ECLS liberation on decannulation is equal to weaning, because weaning is a process. It's a process how to wean and uh, prepare the patient to discontinue the ECLS and to, uh, for the patient to stay stable. And uh, we cannot just uh, Decannulate the patient and uh, um, leave him uh, without um, ECLS. It's not. Uh, it can be also dangerous. And why can um, we? Uh, why we do discuss um, this whole weaning process is also um, and how difficult it is um, is shown in the publication, last publication from uh, Luigi Camporotta and his um, group. So they suggested a uh, two steps um, weaning process uh, with the first, uh, um, first um, test of ECMO deoxy challenge test and then um, ECMO um, CO2 challenge um, test. And um, as uh, exactly the same way like uh, Karolinska, Regensburg, disease resolution, spontaneous breathing and hemodynamically stable patient um, are criteria to initiate um, the weaning process. And um, in this publication, we can, um, they, they focus more on two-step uh, weaning process. But um, the traditional weaning process is um, also described very well in the Red Book by Helgen Buschen. And, <coughs> he, um, Described or um, he describes um, how to start uh, with weaning of sweep gas flow, stepwise reduction to zero, then adjust to the respiratory rate and um, FiO2 levels uh, if patient on mechanical ventilation. The eventual some centers um, um, also um, wean uh, extracorporeal blood flow parallel to the sweep gas flow to set a minimum flow, but this strategy bring also some uh, disadvantages, especially for the anticoagulation, because uh, 
with minimum flow, minimum flow, there is um, a higher risk uh, for clotting, but uh, we also want um, less anticoagulation because, um, before decannulation. So um, this um, probably the best way is to um, set the blood flow something about two, two and a half liter per minute, per minute, per minute uh, with uh, um, something like 600 um, units of um, heparin and um, to and then remove heparin um, maybe six or um, eight hours before the cannulation to um, keep um, all this stable. Um, then it's recommended to monitor mixed venous saturation in the conventional way, uh, especially a steep drop may indicate weaning failure. And of course, as said, stable hemodynamic, hydrodynamic condition no severe different organ failure and adequate oxygen delivery are the achievements um, of uh, weaning uh, and patient for the patient uh, who can be uh, weaned. What about mechanical ventilation and the settings? Um, the ventilator um, settings um, appropriate to allow the cannulation vary from patient to patient, but what we know the Lung protective ventilation should be continued, and um, also the same um, PRO2, FeO2 ratio above 100 without ECLS and a high, um, normal hypnea with pH uh, about um, 7.3 should be safe um, for weaning. There are some patients um, who can um, not be weaned. And um, what we know, average VV ECMO support is about a duration about 12 days. Um, this is um, based on the data from the ELSO registry, but uh, the duration of support does not predict futility. So um, the full, uh, full lung recovery can also be achieved after weeks and months of support. I suppose the uh, most um, longer um, report about um, lung support on, on um, VV ECMO was about um, something like uh, 600 days. Um, but um, during such a long time, ICU and ECMO related complications make prolonged runs difficult and um, one third of the patient may not be able to be weaned. So um, this weaning um, appropriateness should be reviewed regularly. It, of course, depends um, on the patient and uh, on the timeline. Um, what to do if the patient is not, uh, will be not able to be weaned? So um, this is um, some results from the um, survey um, performed by um, Daryl Adams. Um, and um, there are some factors likely to influence decision to withdraw ECMO support. And um, the most of them are patient comorbidities, patient wishes, um, etiology of respiratory failure, patient's age. And the withdrawal of ECMO for futility needs to follow um, ethical guidelines with ongoing discussion with family, the patient, and um, other um, um, physicians who are involved in uh, the treatment. But um, we are talking about weaning, so um, VV ECMO um, allows reduction in the power of uh, uh, invasive mechanical ventilation to provide improved lung protection. And there is increasing evidence in the praxis of liberation from uh, invasive mechanical ventilation during the ECMO. And I will address some of uh, the issues of uh, spontaneous breathing during the ECMO at the end of my presentation. Um, the evidence is limited in guiding the weaning process from both ECMO and um, invasive mechanical ventilation. And there is a little evidence which group of patients benefit of uh, invasive mechanical vent ventilation weaning before ECMO decannulation. So more trials are needed. And this is um, what we wanted um, to explore with um, our survey, which um, 
The aim of this survey was to understand strategies currently used in weaning from VV ECMO and mechanical ventilation, invasive mechanical ventilation. So our survey characteristic, uh, the survey was uh, performed from April to um, end of May 2019, uh, was provided during the ELSO conference in Barcelona, ELSO newsletter and the social uh, media channels. It consisted of uh, 15 multiple choice questions uh, with no requirement to answer all the questions. One response uh, was permitted per center and uh, the uh, participation was uh, voluntary and no respondent data was stored in accordance with the general data protection regulations. So um, center characteristics, we had um, 253 unique center participants. 67 of them were um, ELSO centers. 88% offer pulmonary and cardiac support and 10% of, of them pulmonary only. <coughs> 47 of the centers treated adults only. 32 all age groups, neonatal pediatrics and adults, and um, about half of the centers were reported to perform uh, more than 30 ECMO runs per year. So we asked uh, the participant, how would you describe the uh, weaning strategy in others' patients on um, VV ECMO? And uh, we've got um, quite uh, interesting responses. So the majority, uh, it was about um, 41% 40, um, responded. Um, their strategy is sedation um, after ECMO cannulation, then gradually reduce sedation, assisted spontaneous breathing is allowed and implemented during the ECMO. The extubation or tracheotomy, after ECMO decannulation, the patient is um, separated from the ventilator after ECMO decannulation. So it means about 40% um, wean, um, is weaning the ECMO first and then uh, the ventilator. Then uh, about one third of the participants um, responded, ex uh, they perform sedation at the beginning of the ECMO, then after ECMO cannulation, gradually reduced sedation assisted spontaneous breathing is allowed and implemented during ECMO. And then they try to extubate or track um, the patient during the ECMO and then uh, to um, separate uh, their ventilator before ECMO decannulation with uh, awake ECMO um, weaning. So uh, the most, I believe the most conservative um, strategy with um, controlled mechanical ventilation during ECMO and um, extubation or track uh, after ECMO decannulation uh, was in the uh, minority of uh, the responses, about 16% uh, and about 10% um, of the responses um, perform um, different strategies in um, IRTS patient on VV ECMO. So uh, we explored then uh, 90, about 90% 90 um, of the centers um, titrate sedation to a specific score, e.g. RAS or Ramsey, and uh, about 48% um, um, perform track during the ECMO run, um, and if tracheotomy is uh, performed, it's um, usually uh, between a 7 or 14th a day uh, post-intubation. About um, 75 uh, patients um, were extubated um, after ECMO decannulation and about 12% uh, patients are awake and not intubated um, during the ECMO uh, runs. Um, this is uh, what we um, explored with um, our survey. Um, it means uh, the majority of the patients um, are still um, still ventilated uh, at the point of um, ECMO decannulation. And uh, one of the questions was of co uh, also the winning strategy regarded, regarding uh, to the reason of respiratory failure. And this is uh, interestingly, um, 
about um, and, and these questions, multiple uh, answers were possible, but um, um, okay, about 50% um, of answers, responses um, said, yes, uh, we tend to discontinue ECMO before attempting extubation uh, in patient with RDS. So this is the same what, what we um, explored in the last um, question, but um, about 25% says, um, okay, yes, we tend to avoid intubation or early extubate uh, patient awaiting lung transplant, which um, is uh, the same what we can find in the literature. The most awake, awake patient on, on a VV ECMO are um, transplant um, awaiting patients. And interestingly, about 17% um, uh, um, tend to avoid intubation or early extubate patient with um, COPD. Then uh, one third of uh, participants said no, uh, winning strategy from patient um, on VV ECMO is grossly the same regardless of the reason of, um, for respiratory failure. And uh, maybe, we could um, discuss this um, in, uh, um, in some questions if um, they appear after the presentation. Because um, I strongly believe um, we um, should um, wean different patient group on VV ECMO differently. So, um, what about the reasons one ECMO team members uh, do prefer to extubate the patient on um, the ECMO, extubation come first, or to stop ECMO while continue, continuing mechanical ventilation, so uh, to discontinue ECMO, ECMO come first, came first. Um, what what um, the participant um, said is uh, what they are afraid of. Um, So the, the most um, advantage if the patient can be extubated um, on VV ECMO is um, extubation um, first um, can decrease the risk of ventilation um, associated pneumonia. Um, of course, um, awake patient uh, and um, patient who can move, it's not sedated, uh, it's associated with less muscle, including diaphragma weakness. Um, participant would uh, prefer to um, extubate um, patient because it allows optimal neurological assessment and contact between the patient and the relatives. Um, some of them, and um, if you can see um, the numbers, um, and this also this question uh, was allowed to um, choose uh, multiple answers. So it's uh, like one third, uh, or about 30% for each one. So 30% um, um, would prefer to discontinue ECMO first because um, it allows stopping anticoagulation. Um, what means, okay, in the patient with risk of bleeding, uh, of course, it is the strategy which can be preferred. And um, some, um, there is a group, um, I said 30%, um, they would prefer um, to remove um, ECMO first because managing the patient on ECMO, um, which the patient is awake and spontaneously breathing is too difficult and risky, which um, is true in some uh, circumstances. And of course, uh, managing those patients require uh, a very good qualified staff um, and the station, uh, the department um, has to be uh, well staffed um, because this patient cannot be, um, um, it, it required physiotherapy and, and um, some more attention like uh, then um, the patient who is um, sedated. So uh, summarizing our survey uh, showed significant differences in management of um, Invasive mechanical ventilation, sedation, and ECMO during VV ECMO. And uh, the differences are also among centers and clinicians as well. And uh, one, one out of three participants consider 
weaning of um, invasive mechanical ventilation before ECMO, which um, is demonstrating a growing perception about the practicality and feasibility of awake ECMO, also in non-transplant patients. And um, there are some, a few, not so many, so the most publication we can find about um, awake ECMO are about transplant patients, but um, um, there are two very good one from um, Gattinoni, Thomas um, Lange group, and um, the group of um, Dirk Donka, and um, they described very well disadvantages and advantages of um, awake um, ECMO patient. Um, and um, the most uh, advantage we have um, on um, for the awake patient during the VV ECMO run is, um, of course, well preserved uh, physical condition, active treatment participation, less delirium, ability to eat, drink, and communicate with the family and the medical team. But uh, we um, should also remember that spontaneously breathing have um, enormous consequences um, for the physiology of, uh, of the lung. And um, it means especially um, the, the ventilation perfusion uh, matching is enormously improved uh, because the diaphragm uh, is um, moved in the uh, physical way in the dorsal part. And um, as well, um, functional residual capacity, uh, there are less atelectasis uh, which can be built. Um, of course, we avoid a ventilator-induced diaphragm dysfunction. Um, the intrathoracic pressure is decreased, which improved cardiac filling, cardiac output, and uh, pulmonary lymphatic uh, drainage. And uh, as we mentioned before, um, if the patient is not intubated, uh, we also avoid um, the um, ventilator associated uh, pneumonia. Um, what about the disadvantages? So um, there is a risk of invasive device displacement and this is um, exactly what um, also the participant of um, our survey told us. Um, um, there is also a kind of patient discomfort, pain and anxiety. So we need um, a bit different um, drugs, not um, for sedation, but more for pain and um, anxiolytics. And um, we have some um, physiological changes like um, positive transpulmonary pressure, which uh, means um, the airway pressure minus pleural pressure can increase in um, similarity to mechanical ventilation, which can be um, in some situation if the patient is not ready for um, this kind of um, breathing, um, a, a huge disadvantage. And um, what can occur is a kind of lung damage um, induced um, by spontaneous ventilation, it's um, called um, spontaneous ventilation induced lung injury. Um, it is caused by uh, spontaneous hyperventilation. And um, not last but not least, um, if um, the breathing work is very high, we have a high O2 consumption and a CO2 production with um, high costs of breathing, which um, can turn um, and uh, worsen hypoxemia and cause uh, mus muscle exhaustion. So um, for this reason, um, we um, cannot just um, stop the sedation in every patient. It, um, the, the patient selection um, has to be done very carefully, but um, I believe the evidence um, is growing and uh, we should try. We should try to select um, those patients um, who um, could be a good candidate um, to be weaned uh, from um, invasive mechanical ventilation during the VV ECMO run. 
So um, summarizing my um, thoughts um, of this presentation, um, I would like to say there is a huge variation um, in the VV ECMO weaning management strategies. Um, it uh, has been observed between centers um, and um, it's maybe influenced by case mix experience and center volume. And um, our group um, which uh, performed this um, survey um, suggests further researches on how clinicians and centers decide in favor of weaning um, from um, invasive mechanical ventilation before ECMO, maybe a kind of um, a trial. Um, ECMO first versus a ventilator first or um, another kind of uh, trials um, to um, explore um, the physiology of uh, spontaneous breathing um, during um, um, the um, pulmonary support on uh, VV ECMO. So um, this is um, the last uh, conclusion and um, at the end of my presentation I would like to invite you all to our upcoming um, conference. Um, it will be in uh, London next year um, in uh, May, and uh, we will bridge the gap between, um, however, uh, spontaneous uh, ventilation um, and uh, the cannulation, maybe. Um, there are um, a lot of gaps uh, and unanswered questions uh, in uh, our ECMO strategies and um, ECMO management uh, procedures. Um, and last but not least, I would like to uh, address um, some um, social um, media accounts um, where um, you can find uh, also information about our society and upcoming webinars. Um, we also have a group um, of people who are very um, active um, to find out the newest publication about um, ECMO and uh, um, the newest um, um, EURISO Journal Club um, just has been um, released. So you're welcome to join us and follow us on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, thank you for your attention. Well, Justina, thank you so much for your great presentation. Uh, that was really nice. Um, first, giving all the rationales for potential benefits, but also for risks of uh, either of the strategies, either getting rid of the ECMO early or uh, rather pushing for keeping the ECMO and then winning the patient of the ventilator and the later course. Um, I think you, you've, you've done a fantastic job in, in summarizing uh, not only uh, the available evidence and, and some recommendations by some groups, but also Congratulations on, on, on this great survey. I think, first of all, um, you choose very, very meaningful questions that really make a difference in decision taking. And uh, I, I think that has been appreciated by the participants of the survey, um, um, also reflected in, in the different practices. And um, you mentioned that you think there, there may maybe individual differences in on how to approach situations and uh, it would be very interesting in discussing your view on this but before i do so my question would be what is your local practice what's the nuremberg algorithm in weaning patients from vv ecmo is there a standard strategy how do you approach that issue so um thank you thank you peter um and thank you for this question so we prefer the um very traditional standardized um, strategy um, described in the red book so um, stepwise um, reducing um, um, sweep gas and um, we keep uh, the blood flow at the level of about uh, two two and a half liter per minute um, and uh, we um, give the patient um, time for recovery. So we, we uh, don't um, force um, the weaning. And um, I think um, it should also be addressed um, um, that weaning is not, as, as we said in one of uh, the slides, um, weaning means not the cannulation. 
So if the patient is not um, ready to be weaned, it's better to um, maybe to wait also three more days and not um, to um, not to um, charm um, and and not to um, uh, bring the risk uh, to um, recannulate the patient. So um, I know the, um, in the opposite, of course, there are risks of infection, of uh, bleeding, uh, if the patient is still on ECMO. But um, I believe um, if the lung can have enough time, if the lungs have enough time uh, to recovery, it's also better for the whole uh, for the whole organism and uh, maybe it's also less cytokines we don't we don't really know uh, what what happened uh, but but um, aggressive ventilation it's there is no no sense to put the patient on the um, aggressive uh, ventilation again and then to remove the ecmo so it's better to to leave the ecmo in the patient and and uh, to um, um, to perform um, lung protective um, ventilation and, and just to wait and, and uh, give um, the lung the time um, for rest and recovery. I, I completely agree with you on this one. So do, do you let your patients uh, start um, breathing spontaneously before you think about weaning either ventilation or ECMO? Apparently um, you yeah. will do so if you extubate the patient, but do you let your patients breathe spontaneously on ECMO? That's the question. Yes, but not continuously. And um, I think it's also um, one of the uh, important um, issues to understand. Um, so um, I always um, wondered um, why, why the patient um, says I have um, weaning is painful and um, um, I believe um, what what we do with the sedation so the, the respiratory muscle and, and intercostal uh, muscle are uh, not working and then uh, we um, drive the patient um, to breathe and and uh, it's like a, um, muscle stress so um, this is what um, what I prefer and, and uh, I believe it should be preferred is uh, to, um, to start short intervals of spontaneous breathing trial if the patient is ready and then um, to, um, to elongate it and, and then maybe to let them uh, breathe spontaneously for 12 hours and then uh, to have a rest at night. Um, and and so on and so on this is quite a process and it should be um adjusted to to the patient not uh, to the protocol okay um so i, I you mentioned something that we had in a webinar with uh, matthew schmidt last year uh, that um, many patients on ecmo with ards they will have a huge respiratory drive once you let them wake up and let them start breathing spontaneously, even when they are on ECMO, even when their black gases are okay. And to my understanding, that's not really understood nowadays why that is the case. So do you have a certain threshold with respect to transpulmonary pressures or to the respiratory drive where you would stop a uh, um, spontaneous breathing trial on ECMO? When you watch the patient, um, I think it should be no stress for the patient. So it means um, um, if the patient is um, sedated, um, he can also um, um, breathe spontaneously, which means um, um, you um, we should not. Um, all the time try to do everything at, at the same moment and I would prefer to um, um, to uh, if if the patient was really very sadly ill uh, in severe um, ARDS with um, um, with um, para it, um, the patient was paralyzed and and so on um, the longer 
this uh, period um, um, has um, has taken, the longer we need uh, for the patient, or maybe uh, twice so long we need for the patient for the recovery. So um, it means um, stepwise uh, reduction of sedation, and the longer sedation um, has also um, some kind of um, rebounds phenomena and delirium. So you cannot just stop the sedation uh, at one day and and uh, um, let the patient breathe. And and uh, for this reason, I believe we should implement the spontaneous breathing during the sedation to um, allow the muscle to um, um, to be to to run to have to to keep some movement at the muscle and then uh, muscles and then um, to perform all these uh, things stepwise and not uh, and not uh, just um, at once everything at, uh, immediately and um, I would um, stop spontaneously um, breathing uh, for the patient if uh, it would be too much uh, oxygen consumption and and um, um, stress. Yes, like I think this, this this is something that this is something we have to assess in these situations, right? So, do I understand you right that you prefer removal of ECMO first and then um, extubation and decannulation, or do you vary in between your patients? Um, I should I believe we should vary because uh, and this is um, also what uh, um, for example the publication of Crotty. Um, from um, 2018 shows so, uh, for uh, the special groups and they um, um, describe three groups, the bridge to transplant group, COPD group and severe at RDS. And definitely for um, lung transplant uh, patient, um, awake ECMO um, should be preferred. Um, the same for COPD and, and um, I mean, this is what we, uh, even do for COPD patient um, uh, what we are doing um, even without um, ECMO. Um, everybody knows uh, COPD uh, patient is uh, better with uh, non-invasive uh, ventilation and uh, no um, tube and, and not intubated. And um, this is what they shown in their publication. And for severe RFDS patient, um, this respiratory drive and and the complications of uh, um, because we don't really know what happened during RDS and and this uh, severe severe inflammation uh, period. Um, this is very very difficult and and uh, the longer the process and the illness, um, the recovery um, will take maybe twice so long. And and uh, for this patient probably we will not be able to implement um, the awake ECMO so, um, so quickly. Or uh, we should tra uh, tra perform the tracheotomy very early and then uh, to wean uh, via track. But um, it, it depends and I, I believe it should be um, decided, uh, um, in, it should be an individual decision. Okay. Now, Justina, when you decide that you extubate a patient on ECMO, what are the absolute predispositions for you? What what are the requirements that a patient needs to fulfill, regardless of the etiology? What, what, in what condition do you want the patient to be in order to be extubated? Um, so, I think uh, let's start uh, from the head uh, to the top. Yeah. Um, so. The the patient sh um, we we can keep a kind of um, sedation or um, like uh, maybe um, Dextor or um, um, pain med medication and then uh, the patient should be awake and um, also spontaneously breathing and should be stable so no vasopressors uh, and so on and it, uh, the patient should not be in delirium. It's uh, the most um, important point, um, I believe. And um, 
the criteria are quite the same, um, like um, um, extubating somebody uh, from the mechanical ve ventilation without ECMO. Um, I mean, if we um, remove the tube, we um, the patient should um, should um, stay stable. Okay, so um, awake, no delirium, uh, no vasopressors, um, stable ECMO condition because. Uh, um, it should not be uh, a kind of um, clotting risk um, and so on and so on because for this moment the patient will stay on uh, respiratory support only de being depending from ECMO not uh, from the ventilator and this is what should we um, remember and um, of course um, no uh, additional risk like uh, severe um, organ failure um, like liver failure or, or something like this, you know, bleeding um, and so on. Right. So you now you mentioned the machine uh, as the, as the other part of the decision that you have to take. Now we have been talking about the patient, but you also mentioned that there may be some issues about the machine itself, clotting and so on. Can you think of situations where you would say you prefer rather ECMO weaning because you have some issues uh, with the machine or the anticoagulation? Talk about bleeding. Talk about repetitive clotting of of the of the of the um, membrane oxygenator. Is that something you consider, or do you see that often that this makes an impact on your decision? Yes. Let's talk uh, about I mean trauma, trauma, ARDS, or so on. Um, definitely. So. Um, for um, for trauma RDS, it's maybe um, less important because you can drive uh, the ECMO run uh, without anticoagulation. Uh, but um, um, we still don't know if uh, ECMO um, also can um, also trigger um, bleeding. And um, for this um, reason, I would be aware um, about. Uh, any kind of um, traumatic injuries and and uh, um, brain injured patient um, on the ECMO. So um, in the past, um, someone believed um, we could uh, um, adjust um, CO2 removal um, for managing um, severe brain uh, injuries. But uh, the issue with the anticoagulation and, and the brain is so um, tricky that I would um, recommend um, to keep uh, um, the uh, period on the um, ECMO um, so short as possible. And it would be for me, the patient, to remove the ECMO first uh, as quickly as possible. If the patient okay. doesn't need, uh, just um, decannulate. Okay. Now you you very nicely mentioned that weaning does not only mean extubation, does not only mean stopping an ECMO, but there's a lot of facets in between. And you very nicely gave the rationale for for having a patient awake, uh, as in um, keeping a neuromuscular competency alive and 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 to to keep the patient moving in a way. So do you uh, perform mobilization and physiotherapy in uh, patients on the ECMO, either on a tube or while being extubated? Yes, and, and I would um, definitely recommend uh, to do it so. And uh, the last um, famous uh, video we uh, shared on social media with, uh, so not from um, our clinic, but it was shared from um, from the US uh, with uh, um, permission of the patient and their uh, relatives was a boy uh, who was playing basketball on, uh, with ECMO, uh, with Avalon. So it's, it's really um, amazing and, and uh, um, there are a lot of um, reports uh, and especially kids are very, um, um, very smart with, uh, with mobilization. Um, with ECMO, um, but but there are also a lot of uh, amazing um, reports about adults, and and it's uh, it's very important. Yes, there's there's one of the questions of one of our participants who, who says they don't have double lumen cannula available, and if you would think that it is 
safe and feasible to also mobilize patients with the femoral uh, uh, uvula uh, cannulation strategy. It it is feasible. And of course, uh, their um, cannula um, has to be secured, um, and and the patient has to be um, advised to be to be careful. So, um, as I said, uh, the department um, um, should be well staffed, and and uh, for the beginning, um, um, there is a need for maybe three, four. Um, um, people who are um, helping with mobilization, but before we start with um, um, to mobilize from uh, outside of the bed, you can also um, um, there are a kind of um, um, bed bikes, so it's like a bike which is uh, put into the bed, and the patient can um, um, trample um, in inside the bed. So it's also a kind of uh, mobilizing uh, patient. And, and any kind of um, um, different activities, um, and it's um, it's not impossible to sit uh, with the femoral cannula. It's also possible. Yes, and the, the, this is also our perception, and I think there's quite some data um, from Michigan on that. Um, um, you, you mentioned uh, over and over again that's a, that this is an issue of staffing. Um, we also call this, whenever we do a mobilization on, on patients with ECMO, we call it like it's an intensive care family get together because there's at least one doctor, there are nurses, there are um, usually two physiotherapists. And it's about, um, especially when you run a program that you build up, it's about building up trust and sharing responsibilities in such situations. So that you never get into that uh, idea of uh, who takes the blame if anything happens. And I mean, of course, in a program like you run, this is probably routine. But um, when we when we talk to people at the conferences and the meeting, we learn that even some centers who have rather large numbers of ECMO patients per year, they they um, still didn't get into the mobilization issue at that point. So so just a comment from my side. So um. Justina, um, now that we know that this issue is tackled so differently from different centers um, and accepting that we don't have really good evidence on how to do it, except that as we usually do, we say it needs to be individualized, which is which is true. What would be the next step in steps in terms of um, Gaining evidence. What kind of studies do we need? What are you? What are your ideas on how to enlighten this matter? Yes, um, this is this is a very good um, question, and um, the more I, I think about it, the more um, uh, different uh, trials uh, ideas um, I have. Uh, so at the beginning, um, as we uh, started with the survey, I thought it's easy. We just uh, um, try uh, ECMO first versus ventilator first, but it's not so easy. And and uh, um, I believe if we would like to perform a study like this to um, um, even randomize or uh, observational, we should um, um, divide the patient um, patients uh, into the group, and and probably uh, we should. Um, because there is a, a lot of evidence about um, ERDS patients, um, about um, ECMO who, um, selection criteria, and so on and so on. So um, probably we should uh, put more attention um, to this group, especially because we know this group uh, um, is um, um, less. Um, um, adapted um, or is, is um, longer on sedation, so it's, it's difficult to wean um, and to keep them um, awake uh, after the long um, period of um, RFDS. But uh, the easiest study probably could be to, to evaluate um, a kind of um, complications um, um, in, in regarding to uh, to weaning, so um, what kind of complications we have if we remove um, ECMO first and and uh, 
another group um, if we uh, wean the patient um, from uh, from the ventilator for example um, to ask um, um, how many of the patients who are uh, weaned um, from the ventilator has to be um, um, how, how many of them have to be uh, re-intubated or uh, um, how many um, ECMO recannulation we perform and so on and so on how, um, bleeding um, complications um, it could also be an issue um, just to just to show um, then in awake patient I, I would this is what what I would await there's um, um, not the, the the amount of the complications shouldn't be so uh, um, so high as people probably afraid are afraid of yeah but um, yes so maybe maybe these two ideas of the complications rate and and uh, um, ECMO first um, versus uh, ventilator first in RDS patients. Okay. So, Justina, I, I reviewed all of the questions of the participants, and I think uh, as a last point for today's discussion, I would like to go back and, and ask you um, uh, again about some practical aspects, because there's quite some questions still coming in about how low does the blood flow have to go before we can wean ECMO, and, and you mentioned some of this. Now, um, talking about the, the uh, um, Italian paper from Vasquez uh, about the deoxy challenge test and the CO2 challenge test, could you just please very briefly give the practical aspects of each of those maneuvers and what your, at least your personal um, criteria would be for failing or passing those tests and when can you actually win or, or stop, stop ECMO in a patient? And take the respiratory side away. Let's let's presume the patient is is ready to go from his lungs. But how do you practically turn off the ECMO? Which steps do you take? Yes. So um, regarding to the first um, question and the Vasquez pa paper and and this two step uh, maneuver, um, so they uh, describe um, um, the proving of uh, oxygenation first. So they uh, and 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 then uh, um, to uh, reducing a sweep gas. So the 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 first the first step is to be sure uh, the patient can uh, oxygenate. Uh, the, the oxygenation function of the lung is uh, recovered. Uh, in my opinion, um, um, normally if we wait uh, long enough, probably. Um, one step um, weaning procedure uh, with uh, stepwise um, reducing sweep gas flow is enough and um, regarding to the question how, how to do it um, if we have a patient and um, the patient should be in the stable condition so uh, we can see the underlying disease um, is um, recovering and um, the patient um, is stabilizing, uh, vasopressors uh, are going down, down and uh, the tidal vol volume is coming and the compliance uh, of uh, the lung um, is also improved. Um, we um, always adjust uh, blood flow and uh, sweep gas um, during this period. And then if we decide, okay, um, probably um, the sweep gas flow is about one liter per minute and uh, blood flow is um, about two, two and a half, um, just to turn off uh, the sweep um, gas flow for, one hour and then um, see what happened. Um, of course, uh, the um, um, blood gas analysis um, has to be performed, um, and, um, and it, this is the easiest way, uh, in my opinion, just to just to um, uh, evaluate if the patient is is ready for um, for um, the weaning trial. Okay, so to be to be very clear about it. 
you don't have to reduce the flow of the VV ECMO necessarily, but you have to get rid of the sweep gas and then assess the lung function of the patient. Um, if you believe in it, ideally spontaneously breathing, you want to make sure the patient still gets along, does not have excess work of breathing, and then you would, with this zero sweep gas, evaluate the patient for, for decannulation. Yes, exactly. Okay. Justina, thank you so much for this very fruitful discussion. Is there anything you wanted to add at this point of, of our webinar? Yes, uh, I would like to um, um, ask all the people to, um, if they um, win the patient on the ECMO, try to uh, keep, um, keep them, uh, not to keep them deep sedated. Just um, even if they are not, uh, um, if it's not feasible to keep them awake, don't sedate people too deeply. It will be probably easier for the father weaning from the mechanical ventilation and from the VV ECMO. And uh, it should be my take home uh, message uh, no deep sedation, please. Okay. Justina, so with these words as last tips and conclusion of, of this very, very nice webinar, thank you so much. We are, we are kind of in the final leg. Um, again, as you thankfully have already mentioned, uh, we invite all of you to come to London next year, 2020, uh, May 6 to 8, to join our annual meeting with a lot of exciting faculty, a lot of exciting uh, um, discussions, presentations, where all of us can still learn a lot and, and where we can exchange, have a very nice community event. Um, this is for one. The other one, and please show the last slide that all of us have been looking at now uh, during the discussion. Um, I would also like to thank you, Justina, for putting a lot, a lot of work into the social media channels of URLZO, which is namely uh, the Facebook account uh, the Twitter account, and we also have an Instagram account, and also a dedicated web page for the Congress uh, itself. There's uh, lots and lots of very interesting and actual information. And Justina, thank you once again for running this for for the society. That's very very valuable. And for our participants, if you're not on these channels yet, check it out and and stay tuned with them. So as last announcement, um, the next webinar will be conducted by Felix Hennig from Berlin. Uh, on transition from VA ECMO to a uh, ventricular assist device. And this is very likely to be held on December 5th, 2019 at 4 p.m. Central European time. The date will be confirmed in short. And if you are a subscriber of the URL, so a newsletter, you will uh, receive an invitation very soon. Otherwise, just um, have a look at the website and stay with the URL. So uh, so as the last reminder, as every time, um, it's uh, for one, you're only safe if your Venus line is blueberry and your arterial line is cherryberry. And for the other, never ever stop breathing. Otherwise, it may cost your life. Thank you very much for joining us today. This is Peter Shalongowski from Vienna on behalf of EuroElzo. Have a nice day and I see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.